Welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Space is the final frontier for man and also the movies that we make. Now, due to technological limitations, costs, and the Trade Federation blockade over our planets, we haven't filmed the movie in space just yet. Luckily, that hasn't stopped us from using all sorts of creative methods to recreate space travel in films. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the more recent space movies and break down the inaccuracies in them. We won't be talking about the recent First Man movie because American Ben has already done videos on that film. You can check them out over here. Gravity is an impressive movie from both the cinematic standpoint and also because of Sandra Bullock's performance. Especially if you consider the fact that she's basically hung up in a harness in front of a green screen the whole time and just using her imagination. Though the creators of this film are also using their imagination a lot when they created the script. But before we break down the film, we do have to point out that for a mainstream Hollywood blockbuster, they do get a lot of things right. For one, they didn't include any sound in space. And in my opinion, having such vivid explosions and collisions on screen without any sound creates an eerie feeling that is equally as alarming. I also relate really the premise of the film where a Russian missile strikes one of its own communication satellites and creates a gigantic debris field. NASA scientist Don Kessler theorized that such an event could happen in orbit as a growing number of debris from space missions continue to collect there. Known as the Kessler Syndrome, it states that with each collision of space theory in orbit, the chances for more collisions arise until it creates a domino effect which then will make space travel very difficult. The only problem with this premise is the Russians being responsible for this missile attack. Although Russia and the United States actually do have the capability to do this, the event in the film actually mirrors very closely to what the Chinese Communist Party did in 2007. They sent an anti-satellite missile towards one of their own satellites at an altitude high enough that it created a gigantic debris field of over 150,000 particles. This pissed off a lot of countries, but because China is one of the largest growing movie markets in the world, and movies that portray China in a negative light are censored by the Chinese Communist Party, they decided to make the bad guys Russian instead. Which financially was a good move on their part, only 34 foreign films were allowed to enter the Chinese market in 2013, and Gravity was one of them, and ended up dominating the charts during its opening week. This is definitely a growing problem in our movie industry, and we as consumers should keep our eye on it. It's sad that the Chinese people are restricted in such a way, and it's sad that the actions of one government is affecting the creative decisions of all of our films. In the beginning of the movie, George Clooney is flying around in an MMU, joking around with his fellow astronauts in a very casual manner. In reality, the MMU is far slower and has a very limited amount of fuel. Also, spacewalks are highly choreographed, and the astronauts actually run through them in simulation before they carry them out in real life. They definitely aren't as casual as they are portrayed in this film. Now, this scene is there for character development, but it fails to portray the real seriousness and precision of actual spacewalks. In the film, the debris from the Russian communication station immediately reaches the Space Shuttle Explorer, which is doing repairs on the Hubble Space Station telescope without warning and does a massive amount of damage. The problem here is the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting at around 350 miles above the surface of the planet at an inclination that gives it maximum exposure over the United States. Communication satellites are usually kept in a geosynchronous orbit, which is around 22,000 miles above the Earth. Now, there's a very, very tiny chance that some debris from that higher orbit might reach the lower orbit, but it's basically impossible for a gigantic debris cloud to travel from such a high orbit to such a low orbit that quickly. The collision forces Sandra Bullock and George Clooney's character to use the MMU to travel all the way to the International Space Station, which is apparently located only 900 miles away. We have to make our way to the space station. to use their escape pod. This is very unlikely to happen because again, the Hubble Space Telescope is orbiting at 28.5 degrees in order for maximum exposure over the United States. Whereas the ISS was built as a joint venture with Russia and therefore its inclination is at 51.6 degrees. Not only is it orbiting at a different inclination, the ISS is also orbiting at 100 miles lower than the Hubble Space Telescope. Sandra Bullock eventually arrives at the Chinese space station called the Tiangong, 
which also gets destroyed by that same wave of destruction somehow. The problem here is not only the different orbits, but the size of the space station. Tiangong was actually a prototype station that was only 10 meters long, not the gigantic sprawling complex that we see in the movie. Although like in the movie, it did eventually deorbit and go into an uncontrolled descent. Despite some of these inaccuracies, most of the astronauts and physicists who saw this film have given it a lot of praise. Because at the end of the day, movies are for entertainment, and also, there's only so much real estate up there for a Sandra Bullock to destroy. Also, if she doesn't make it inside of a pressurized environment, we'll never get to see her take off her spacesuit and get into that skimpy, sexy astronaut undersuit. Which is also a myth. She would actually be wearing this. It's a liquid cooling ventilation garment with a space diaper. Christopher Nolan's Interstellar is another film worth mentioning. It's visually stunning, the plot is classic Nolan, and it also pushes the boundaries of theoretical science. One of the coolest parts of the film was when they landed on a planet orbiting a black hole. While the time dilation aspect of the scene is definitely plausible. What are you waiting for? Let's go. Go, 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 go. Seven years per hour here. Gravity bends not only space, but time as well. So it kind of makes sense that time would pass longer on a planet that close to a black hole compared to, let's say, Earth. It's also why a watch will travel minutely slower when you're standing on the ground compared to if you were on a plane. But could a planet actually exist that close to a black hole? Well, most likely not a planet like the one we see in the movie. For one, there would be very little light on such a planet. The accretion disk does emit some visible light, but it mainly shoots out x-rays along with many other terrible things, which would strip away the atmosphere of the planet. Also, judging by how slow time is moving on the planet, it's very close to the center of the black hole, which means its orbit should be going at such a high speed that the planet probably should have been ripped apart by tidal forces. That speed also makes it incredibly difficult for someone to safely land on it. Unfortunately, the gigantic waves that really makes the scene aren't that realistic. Instead, the water would kind of just bulge out instead of form a gigantic wave. The type of wave we see in the film is more likely to have been caused by a catastrophic seismic event or space debris, which is more likely given the location of the planet. The planet where we unfortunately run into Matt Damon in his true state as an evil psychopath hiding beneath the skin of a kind and caring normal person is also not that realistic. The main problem here is the gigantic floating clouds of ice. Ice is simply too dense and too heavy to float in air. Like Matt Damon, this planet is a lie. Now I do believe that Matthew McConaughey represents the best that the world can offer post okra. But jumping into a black hole to collect quantum data is probably one of the dumbest things you can do. First of all, anyone attempting to do this is committing suicide. Anyone who attempts to jump into a black hole will get spaghettified. Tidal forces from the black hole would stretch your body past its elasticity. Your limbs would pop out of their sockets, probably your hips and your legs first, and eventually you are torn into little pieces. Before that happens, you'll probably be killed by a gamma ray burst. Now, we have no idea what really happens to you after you become spaghettified, but you definitely aren't going to be able to return to the living world. So that whole scene with Matthew McConaughey reuniting with Mirth is probably just a dream sequence because it can't happen. Steven Spielberg is a master at recreating real-life stories in a believable, acceptable manner for most theatergoers. Now, obviously, if you're a mouth-breathing basement dweller who man PMSs about the incorrect serial numbers on the exterior panels of the lunar module, you'll also be bothered by the fact that the Saturn V launch vehicle was rolled out onto the launch pad just two days before the launch instead of weeks before, like in real life. You'll also be bothered by the fact that the crew hears a bang immediately after following Houston's orders to stir the oxygen hydrogen tanks, when in real life, it doesn't happen until 93 seconds later. But perhaps one of the biggest myths in the entire movie is the most famous line from the movie. This is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Because that never happened. But most of the dialogue between the astronauts and Mission Control were copied verbatim from the actual transcripts from the mission. And because this film was based on a real-life actual mission, and it was directed by Steven Spielberg, it's pretty accurate from a scientific standpoint. The Martian is another film that is widely lauded for its scientific accuracy. While it is an entertaining film, the whole premise of the movie that the United States government and NASA would spend all that money just saving Matt Damon is completely impossible. After starring in the film Interstellar along with the much more likable Matthew McConaughey, there is a moment. 
Matt Damon wanted to create a movie where he was again left on a deserted planet, but this time he's the good guy and not some psychopathic murderer. Once again, we have a scenario where US taxpayers have to pay for the mistake that is Matt Damon. And just like in Saving Private Ryan, he risks the lives of the rescuers coming to save him. Earn this. A situation like this could only happen in the disturbed mind of Matt Damon. Also in the film, he walks way too normally on the surface of Mars. Mars's gravity is actually 38% of Earth, so he would be doing more of a skip hop kind of thing. Also, Mars's atmospheric pressure is quite low, which means although the dust storms can reach 100 miles per hour, because of how thin the air is, they aren't quite as dangerous as the ones we see in the film. What is more dangerous is the fact that astronauts spend the majority of their time on the surface of the planet in the movie, and their habitats seem to have no protection from radiation. If we do go to Mars one day, radiation will be a huge problem. As a matter of fact, scientists right now designing habitats for Mars are focusing on creating subterranean structures. Well guys, that is our video for today. Um, I would like to say that all the films that I mentioned in this video are actually really good. Don't let these historical inaccuracies prevent you from enjoying movies because then life would suck. I mean, I mean, even The Martian is good. I hate Matt Damon, but he did a really good job in the film. I gotta say. Also, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button. As usual, my name is Alan, and life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.